All right, let's take our Bibles here to this morning and let's go to the book of Isaiah, chapter number 41, if we could. Isaiah, chapter number 41. There was a pastor who had a five-year-old daughter. The little girl noticed that every time her dad stood behind the pulpit and was getting ready to preach, he would bow his head for a moment before he began to preach. The little girl noticed that he did this every time. So one day after the service, the little girl went to her dad and asked him, Why do you bow your head right before you preach your sermon? Well, honey, the preacher asked, or answered, I, I'm asking the Lord to help me preach a good sermon. Well, the little girl looked up at her father and asked, Well, how come he doesn't do it? <laughs> I've never had that problem before. Man. <laughs> as funny as that may sound, some people, when it comes to finding help for their problems, actually struggle to believe God will help them. They really do. Maybe today you're one of those people you really struggle to believe that God is willing to help you with your problems and your circumstances in life. Now, there are a number of reasons why people sometimes come to that mindset. But today, my desire from God's Word is to help to try to dispel that. Try to dispel that and realize here today that you have a helper and I have a helper in God himself. And throughout our lives, we will find that problems of life are bigger than we are. The emotional concerns are heavier than we can carry. And I need a power that is greater than I. And that's who God is. And that's where God comes into the picture here this morning. We're just going to look at one verse. Keep it simple. But it's a powerful verse found in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 41, verse 10. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. That's a powerful promise from God's word here today. I'd like to expound it a little bit more as we talk about the help of God. The help of God. Let's pray. Father in heaven today, we need your help. We need your help as individuals. We need your help as a nation today because we cannot, we don't have the answers to the problems that exist around us or even in our own personal lives. But you are the solution. And today we invoke your help to understand this and find hope maybe in, for a need that we have. Lord, if there be any here today that struggle with this idea, I want to encourage us, encourage them through your word to find the help that they need. May you get glory today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, our text opens today with a commonly spoken phrase from God that you find throughout the Scriptures. It's, fear thou not. Sometimes it, it comes as, fear not. But however it is, there are a number of times in Scripture where you see a phrase like this or some derivative of this phrase that is communicating this kind of truth. And you say, well, why is it doing that? Well, it's because it's our tendency here this morning to fear. Have you had some fears this week? Most likely, in some regards, you have. As I have. It is our tendency to fear, to become concerned because we are in some cases, overwhelmed by life's circumstances and life's problems. And that fear, if not dealt with, turns to stress. And stress creates problems for us spiritually, emotionally, and physically. I've read statistics as high as 80 per, they believe that 80% of physical ailments are linked in some regards to stress. To stress. And really what stress is, 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 is fear. It, it, it's, it's linked with fear. Jesus pointed out in the last days in which we live would be a stressful time. And it has proven to be such the case. <laughs> we live in a very stressful day and age. And as a result of that, in Luke 21, 26, men's hearts failing them for fear. And for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. In other words, uh, there will be hearts that are failing them for fear. In other words, the stress of the day and age as they are concerned of things to come and, and, and the things that are happening around them 
will overwhelm them and their hearts will fail. And I'm sure most of us know of people or maybe we've experienced some sort of physical heart problems ourselves because of, well, stress. Stress. It's not God's desire for us today to live a stressed out existence. He told his disciples uh, the night before he was crucified, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And he, and he gives them words of comfort uh, and words of instruction meant to, to calm them down so that their hearts weren't overwhelmed with fear and stress. In fact, he goes on in the same chapter, verse 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You know, God desires to give you some peace within your soul in your heart and your life. And even in the chaotic world in which these disciples lived and we live in today, God promises that we can have peace that passes all understanding. Uh, John 16, 33, These things I have spoken unto you that you might have peace. You might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. That you might have peace that you might not be so fearful. You know, one of the biggest reasons people don't have peace in their lives really stems back to the fact that they have yet to solve their greatest problem in life or have their greatest question answered in life. They have never discovered the truth about what happens after they die. In other words, they, they don't know for sure that when they die, if they'll go to heaven. Now, there are many people that assume it because, well, I've, I've lived a decent life and I've gone to church and I've been nice to my neighbor and I've given to charity and I've volunteered and I've, I've been baptized. I've been doing all these different things. But yet, deep in the recesses of their heart, the idea of death and eternity is a fearful thing. It is because it's because they don't know what's going to happen. They, they hope for the best, they're assuming the best, but they don't know what's to come. They don't know what's going to happen. And that's their biggest question, and really their biggest problem that needs to get solved, is what happens when I die? And it's a very real fear in the life of people. What, what's going to take place? In fact, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 15 says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he, Jesus, also himself likewise took part of the same. In other words, he became flesh and blood like us. That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Many people today fear death. And even try to control their circumstances thinking that they can somehow outwit death and get around it. I think it was Michael Jackson. He had hired a, a bunch of doctors to examine him from head to toe every single day of his life because he wanted to live to 150. He only made it a third of the way. He, he died at 50. But people have thought that they could, they, they could outfox death. They could find some fountain of youth or or, or, or whatnot. Now, I'm all for, for trying to be healthy and doing things like that, but you know what? Ultimately, we're all going to face the same reality at some point. We're all going to cross that threshold into eternity called death. That We're going to go through that door called death that leads in that direction. And nobody has control over when they die. Nobody does. I've known people who have died in their infancy, and I've known people who've died in, you know, in their 90s, and everything in between that. And I think everyone here, if you've lived long enough, you've met enough people, you know the same. You, uh, death is no respecter of age, by any means. We have no control over when we die. We're just told to be prepared, to be prepared, because this is an eminent part of life. Being prepared to die is the most important thing to have secured. Because you'll never really be able to live with that fear 
of death or fear of the unknown after death dangling over your head. How can you live free and joyous if you know, not knowing what's going to take place after you die? Now, some people push that out of their minds. They, they're too busy entertaining themselves silly to, to think about it. But I tell you something, you, you, when, when a funeral happens, people sober up. Because that reality sets in, like, whoa. Or if they hear somebody unexpectedly passing on, it's like, whoa. You know, it's just like, it, it's, death has a way of sobering us, doesn't it? If you've ever been around it, it's just like, it, it, it is a sobering thing. Because it is final, and it is real. And there's a, a fearful part of that. Being prepared to die is the most important thing we can do. Because you'll never be able to live until you're prepared to die. And I know people who have almost secluded themselves and made themselves safe spaces, again, thinking that they can somewhat extend their life that way, but you and I will never be able to avoid it. Again, instead, we are called to be prepared for it. And God has a plan in which you and I can be prepared for eternity. Jesus called it in John 3, 3, being born again. He told a very religious man who had that same type of question on his mind. A man who had been, been staunchly religious. I mean, um, uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin, these were people that kept the, the most minute parts of the Levitical and Mosaic laws. Outwardly, they were revered as almost perfect. But yet there was this man, Nicodemus, that came to Jesus at night and he, he had a thought in his mind about eternity. Despite all that good that he had tried to do, despite all that he was, he was trying to be, he still had no assurance about heaven. But he wanted it. And I think that's why he came to Jesus. And that's a good place to go. <laughs> you you want to know how to, be, how to be right with God, how to go to heaven? You start with Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6. You start with him. And that's what he did. And, and Jesus responded to this man, Verily, verily, I say unto you, unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Very plainly spoken here. Unless you're born again, there is no kingdom of God for you. That event has to happen in your life. It must ha there must be a time where that event takes place, and it's a specific time in a specific place where it takes place. In fact, Jesus repeats himself in verse 7, Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. We've got a song in our songbook, ye must be born again. It, it, it's written about this, this story here in John 3. Ye must. This is Jesus speaking. Ye must. It doesn't say, well, you maybe can be, or it would be a good idea. This is, or it, it, it would be best. No, you must. That means it's a demand. If you're going to see heaven, you have to have a time in your life when you have been born again. You say, how is a person born again? Simply this. First off, you have to realize some things about yourself, like I had to, that are not always comfortable. That though we are as people try to be good and maybe we're doing better than some of our neighbors and that may be very much the case. But God's not going to judge us based on how our neighbor behaves compared to us. He's going to judge us according to his righteous standard, his perfect law of liberty, his, his law in his book. And uh, it's perfect. And when we begin to look into the scriptures and we see those commandments, those ten commandments as an example, we begin to realize that we're not quite as holy as God is, are we? <laughs> the Bible says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.10 says, there is none righteous, no, not one. And, and think about it here today. Who can say here you have not sinned? I can't say that. I've sinned more than I wanted to. We are all guilty sinners. And as a result of that sin, we are, as the Bible puts it, condemned. Because Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. There's a punishment for sin that will be met out in eternity. If one is not prepared for it, it's death. Death means separation. There will be a separation from God and from heaven. 
Well, there's only one other place. There's no, there, there's no other place but this place I'll mention. Now there's some that will say, oh, there's a purgatory. You can kind of get yourself worked out and, uh, and, and then you can eventually get there. No, there's no purgatory in the Bible. There's nothing like that. There's no middle ground. There's no abyss. There's no uh, um, nirvana or whatever. There's nothing like that. The Bible says there's only a heaven and a hell. It's pretty plain as see. Say, Jesus never preached on hell. Uh, you haven't read the New Testament. He's preached, he, he spoke a lot on it. He spoke of it as being a place of fire and torment and all this kind of stuff. Read Luke 16. That's one of many examples. And that, that's where sin will send us. But it's not God's desire that anybody goes there. For that's why he brought Jesus into this world to be the one who, could, who had the ability to make an atonement for sin. See, our sins need to be paid for because they're crimes against God. But God wants you and I to be right with Him. But that sin problem has to be dealt with. Jesus came 2,000 years ago when he, and he went to a cross and He died on that cross and He shed blood on that cross. And what He did was He, he took the judgment of God upon Himself for our sin so that we didn't have to take that judgment. And He provided an atonement of His blood so that our sins could be blotted out in the, in the record books of God. But the thing is, that transaction has to happen in a person's life. It wasn't an automatic thing, because we all sin individually, and we're responsible for our sins, not the sins of other people. So we have to come to God on our, on our, of our own free will to Him and say, Lord, I, I want to get things right. And I'm genuinely sorry for what I've done against you as a, as a sinner. And I'm willing to turn from my sin and turn to you with all my heart. It's what the Bible uses the word repentance. We recognize our, our sinfulness and we desire to turn from it. And by faith alone, trust Jesus Christ to be the sin payer, no longer myself. See, that's what I did for 20 years of my life. I was trying to pay for my good works, by, or my bad works, with my good works. And I was doing pretty good. Until I looked into the scriptures and found out I, would, I, would, I had more bad works than good works even could cover. Not to mention, the Bible says in Isaiah 64, 6, all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in the eyes of God. In other words, our good works don't impress God. It doesn't matter how much you've gone to church. It doesn't matter how much uh, you have been, if you've been baptized multiple times, or it doesn't matter if you've given money or volunteered or anything like that. That's all works you can do. But the Bible says in Titus 3, 5, it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saves us. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. You know what, if people got to heaven by, by doing good things, you know what they would do about it? You know what they do in heaven? They'd be boasting about it. I gave 30 hours a week to the United Way. I did this, I did that. You know, it's just... Eh. Why? We're notorious that way. <laughs> but the only thing we're going to boast on in heaven one day is that Jesus put us there. <laughs> That's what it's going to be about. And really, when you think about it, if you could earn your way to heaven, you could work your way to heaven, then why did Jesus die to begin with? Answer me that. Amen? Answer me that. In fact, go to the book of Galatians. Hold your place here in Isaiah. But Galatians, in the New Testament there, Paul makes a great statement here because there was some of that works-based salvation kind of creeping back into the churches of Galatia. But he makes a great statement here in, in Galatians 2.21. He says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, in other words, being right with God comes as a result of keeping the law, doing good works, then Christ is dead in vain. In other words, there was no point of what Jesus did. There was absolutely no point because you could do it yourself. The reason he came is because you and I can't do it ourselves, And we need, a, we need a Savior. That's why he is the Savior of the world. He, he came to save the world from its sins that was condemning it. But you have to make the choice to receive him as your Lord and Savior. You have to be willing to be born again as Jesus points out. 
Has that happened to you in your life? I, I know when it happened to me, and I've said it many times from this pulpit, April 4th of 1999, I came to the end of myself. I saw myself lost on the road to hell and deserving it, but I saw that Jesus wanted to save me from that and put me on the road to heaven, and all I had to do was be willing from my heart, be willing to turn to him in repentance and trust him in faith, and I did that that night, and it changed my life. And there are a lot of people here, you could testify that too, but maybe not everybody. Maybe you sit here today, you've never had a time you're born again. You've never been saved. You don't know what ha will happen when you die. And you know what? You're scared about that, and you should be. Because that is the worst thing to have dangling over your head. But it ought to motivate you to seek the answers from Jesus, as this man did in, the, in John 3. And not to just take it lethargically and think, well, I'll just figure it out sometime or whatever. No, this is your eternity. You need to make the decisions now. You need to get it figured out now, not later, because there may not be a later there may not be a later. God loves you and, and desires a relationship with you. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That's what he wants for you, but it's your decision and it's my decision. I made my decision 20-some years ago. Some of you made your decision at whatever junction in your life, but there may be some here today you've never made that decision, and it's time to get that decision made. It is. Because the worst thing you want is to go into your day not prepared for what's to come. Because at some point, you will pass on. Have you had a time in your life? Do you know for sure that if you were to die today, you'll be in heaven and that things are right between you and God? You can know that today. 1 John 5, 13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may, what? Know that you have eternal life. God wants you to know that. Not wish it, not assume it, but know it. Do you know that today? And if you don't know that, that fear will plague you until you die. It will. And I encourage you to settle that before it's eternally too late. Because once we die, our eternity is settled, and there's no going back and no changing course. It's either you're in heaven or in hell. And we don't want to base our eternity off, again, assumptions, but the bedrock promises found in God's word. But we certainly do have other fears today we will face as God's people. Once you get that settled, hey, we're free, fear free. Well, not necessarily. We will have fears still to conquer. And God wants you to know that once you get that settled, he's there to help you. He's available to help you. In our, pre in, in our passage here today, we learn some things about the help of God as we see, first off, the divine presence. Why don't we have to fear? It's because we have God's divine presence in our life today. We have God's divine presence in our life. You know, if you're saved here today, God has promised that he will never leave you nor forsake you. That's a great promise, isn't it? That the God of heaven is never going to leave you nor forsake you. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly or confidently say, The Lord is what? My helper, right? And I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Wow. What a great promise. What a great thought. The presence of God is in the life of a, of a Christian. When a person gets saved, as I mentioned a moment ago, the Spirit of God comes to dwell within them. And God never leaves you. He's, he's there all the time. Now, the unsaved, those who've never had saved, they don't have that promise. In fact, the Ephesians 2.12 says that at that time you were without Christ. When somebody's out, not saved, they're without Christ. They can be religious, but they, they're still without Christ. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and what? Without God in this world. And that's the way we live now. I, I grew up, I had, I had some religiosity, if you will. I was baptized, confirmed, did all the different classes and all that kind of stuff growing up. But you know what? I had a religiosity, but I didn't have Christ. And I knew I didn't have his hope. God was distant. God was not near. And that's a tough place to be in. But if you are saved here today, if you're saved, God has promised his presence will never, ever leave you. But now we say that, but how do I, how come I don't necessarily feel God? How come I don't feel Him near me, if you will? 
And sometimes people ask that question. I, I, God just doesn't feel near. Well, you have to understand first off that the presence of God is not based on how you feel. It's based on fact. It's fact. Do you always feel warm and fuzzy about math facts? <laughs> Some of you do, I know. Yeah, I saw somebody back there. Oh, you know, he's one of those nerds, amen? No, just kidding. <laughs> um, but, I mean, you, you don't get warm fuzzies about certain facts, do you? I mean, it's just, it's just fact. That's what it is. And, 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 and that's what it is. It, it is a fact. You don't always, maybe not always feel the warm fuzzies with those facts. But I, I will go a little bit further and say this. Sometimes God doesn't feel near because we are distant. We are distant. Now James 4.8 says, Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. This is, this is addressing people who have been saved. I'll call them Christian people. It says, draw nigh to God. It means that we have to make a conscious choice to draw close to God. That means we can, as a result, also make a choice not to draw nigh to God. And God, does, if God doesn't feel near, if I can use that term again, maybe it's because we're distant today as a saved person. Sometimes God's people get distant from God. There were times in their life when they were close to God, but today there, you know, there's some gap. There's a bit of a gap between them and God. And sometimes the reason God feels so far away is because we've gotten so far away ourselves, And we've spent so little time trying to get close to him. So little time. Everything else takes precedence, you know, in life. Everything else is, is getting the, the, our best, our priorities, if you will. But the Bible says we are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. God, God wants us to put him first. The first commandment of the Ten Commandments is that you shall have no other gods before me. That means he should be number one. Above any and all else. And maybe today you feel distant from him because, on, to be honest with you, you haven't spent a whole lot of time with him. Everything else, you know, the job, the hobbies, the entertainments, the, the pursuits, whatever, have gotten in the way. And there's, there's a gap there now. I've used this story before, but I think it illustrates it so well, and I'm sure some of you have heard this before, but there's a story told about an old farm couple who were driving along in their pickup when the wife said, we never sit all snuggled up in the truck like we used to. In which the husband looked at her and just simply replied, well, I haven't moved. <laughs> think about that. When we discover as a church or an individual believer that we aren't as close to God as we once were, understand this, he didn't move. We did. We moved. We moved. You know, each one of us today are as close to God as we want to be. He thought. You and I are as close to God as we have chosen to be today. And if you're distant, that is the decision that you have personally made. And I, and I would personally make. We are, it's the choices we're making in life. It's the priorities that we've put ahead of him that's wrong. Now, if you and I decide that, I, that we want to get close to God, then the fellowship will grow sweeter with time. It will grow sweeter. I, I like this psalm. Psalm 4, verses 6 through 8. There be many, say, many that say, Who will show us any good? The Lord lift up thou, or lift thou up the light of thy countenance upon us. In other words, speaking of getting into his presence, thou hast put gladness in my heart more than in the time that their corn and their wine increased. I will both lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. I want to point out just a phrase there. Thou hast put gladness in my heart more than in the time that their corn and their wine increased. You know what that, that, that uh, corn and wine increase is referring to? The growth of material wealth. And who doesn't like getting a raise? I know some of you have gotten raises lately. Good for you. And that's a, that's a nice thing. It's like, whoa, I, I have a few more bucks in my pocket. 
And we like that. Who doesn't? I don't know anybody that said, oh, I'm going to turn down a raise. <laughs> yeah, right. No. We, 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 we like that. You know, we, we like material blessings. That's just kind of our nature. It brings somewhat of a gladness to our heart. We rejoice when that happens. And rightly so. But you know, what the psalmist is communicating here is that being in the presence of God brings greater gladness than that does. That's what, that, that's what it's saying. You say, that sounds so foreign to me. That's because you're distant from God. Mm -hmm. there, there, there's a unique joy that comes only from God himself that I, I can't explain, but you have to experience. And when you get close to God, it's just like, wow. See, peace is not found in the absence of problems, but in the presence of God. So many of us are trying to make our outside circumstances just perfect, and, we're, and we become almost control freaks at times in some of those circumstances. But you know what? God will, God will break that controlling aspect of our lives and, because he wants to teach us to find peace and joy and gladness in his presence. And, that, and that's what we need. And as you and I get closer to God, the, the fellowship will grow sweeter and sweeter as time goes on. Again, it's in God's presence we're meant to find our greatest joy. Psalm 1611, Thou wilt show me the path of life, and thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. The presence of God is a place we can find real joy that isn't dependent upon everything being perfect in our life. And I'll guarantee you, your life is not going to be filled with perfect things. There'll be great events that happen, but there'll be also some hard events. And we've got to be able to find peace outside of, or joy outside of just everything working right in our life because you'll live a very frustrated, discouraged, bent out of shape life otherwise. The presence of God is, is, is where we find it. And we see here in our text back in Isaiah 41, verse 10, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. I am with thee. That is meant to bring peace and joy, which gives us inner strength. Nehemiah 8.10, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. I guess what it comes down to this morning is this. Today, have you and I made a point of getting close to God? How have you been doing this week? You know, one of the reasons we have this 90-day Bible reading challenge is just to encourage us to get closer to God. Because you get close to God as you open the pages and His Word speaks to you. And then you, when you pray to God, you speak to Him. That's building a relationship. That's communication. How much have you and I invested time in that? The closer we are to God, the more help we'll receive for our hearts over fear. And that's what He promises here. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Secondly, we see the divine possession. Verse 10, it goes on and says, Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. Now it goes on in this verse and encourages us not to be dismayed, which simply means discouraged or down. And sometimes God's people get discouraged in life because they haven't gotten some things they were planning to get in life or they haven't achieved a certain status or, or, or gotten to a certain place in life and as a result they're discouraged. They're dismayed. And even though they can have a lot of other things going on in life that are good, all they can focus on is that one spot, or those couple spots. They're just not as good as they thought. I think we're all guilty of that. I know I'm guilty of that sometimes, where I'm just like, I forget. I do have it a lot better than I think. Sometimes people in their middle ages in particular, I'm talking about 40s and 50s, will go through a time period they, they often refer to as a midlife crisis. A midlife crisis. I think men particularly seem to be susceptible to this as they look around their lives and discover maybe they haven't achieved what they had hoped. And, and sometimes as a result of that, they, they, uh, they revert back to behaviors and time periods in their life in which they felt better. There's a time when, 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 uh, uh, when uh, immoral, uh, immorality can sleep into a, into a relationship. It's a time when when uh, people just do things that, that seem kind of immature. They maybe try to go li relive the old high school days or, or college days, as it were. You know why? Because that time was, seems better than the present, if you will. And like I said, just, just go out and do things that are just kind of 
uh, oh, this is what I feel like doing today. It seems, in some cases, a bit immature for their age. Now, sometimes that whole midlife crisis thing is joked about, but it's a reality in the lives of, of people. And really, it seems to center on this thing of discouragement. They're just discouraged with where they're at, and they, and they feel negative, and they want to go back to a time when they, they don't think that they were so negative. Now, God doesn't want us to be discouraged in life. Why? Because what he says here, for I am thy God, this divine possession, we have him. We have him. God delights in the fact that he is our God. He really delights in that. Revelation 21.3 says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. You know, that thought is, is, goes back to the early days, or early pages of the Bible all the way through the end. God desires to be the God of his people. And you've got to think about who this God is a little bit. You know, this isn't just some little small God that's... He, he's bigger than our minds can even wrap around. He's the one that, in Genesis 1 put the stars in their sockets. He's the one that said, let there be light, and it happened. He's the one that brought about this whole universe. He's the one, he, he created it, he sustained it, he's infinite, he's all-powerful, he's an all-knowing God. And sometimes this doesn't give us any comfort is because that does not affect, or that, that, that knowledge hasn't seeped into our soul or we've forgotten about it. With him, we have everything that we need for this life. And it saddens me to think how many people don't have God in their life, and I was one of them. I honestly don't know how people go through life without God, especially through the dark seasons of life. I just don't know how they do it. I do not know how they do it. You know, back uh, in March, we were over in Israel and and uh, had the privilege of going there a few times over the years and, and uh, arranged some of these trips. And, and the the trips that I've arranged, I've had the same tour guide, uh, this Israeli gal, and her name was Raya, and, and some of you remember Raya. She was, uh, I didn't expect her on this last tour. I thought she had retired, but no, she was still going. She's 80 years old, and let me tell you something. That, that lady was, uh, was uh, going full steam ahead. Uh, she was incredible. But I got talking to her a little bit more on this trip about a little bit of her past, and I, I found out that she had lost her husband here. It was, it was quite a while ago now, but uh, we talked about that time period, and she said that for about two and a half years, I was just in a daze. And I, I just, it was just like I, I couldn't figure out anything. You know, it was, it was so hard. I, I leaned on my husband for, for, for some of the things that we're doing. I was just trying to figure all that out with processing all the emotional things and, and so forth. And, and, and uh, she's a secular lady. She, she is very secular. Uh, and so forth, and she knew about that. We, but we had opportunities over the course of those trips to be able to at least give her the gospel in some regards and, and so forth. But, but I thought about that, and what, going through that time of life without God, I don't know how anybody could do that. Those dark seasons, you know, maybe it's not a death, but maybe it's a, it's a health issue, or maybe it's a financial uh, upheaval, or a loss of a job, or, or something that happens with the kids. You know, could you imagine today not having God there by your side to help you through that? It's interesting, though, that sometimes people who don't have God in their lives will sometimes even come to you during those dark seasons and ask you to pray for them. You ever had anybody do that? Why? Because they know they can't get a hold of God, but they know or they think that you can. If you're a Christian, they know that. What's great is that we as saved people have access to this all-powerful, all-knowing God all the time. Hebrews 4.16 Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We can come confidently before him. And if we know the Lord in salvation, we have the greatest helper that anybody can ever have. And he's more than willing to help us out of if we come to him seeking help. 
Now, there is no doubt somebody that would stand up and say, well, I prayed and I didn't get any help. Can I say this? Sometimes God helps us by not answering our prayers the way we think that they should be answered. God's far, God sees things a lot bigger than we do. Uh, in fact, Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. All I'm saying here is this. God knows how to best answer, and sometimes it's not the way we think he should. Now, that's hard for us to understand at the immediate, but God knows what he's doing. God, God sees things that we can't even begin to see. Or sometimes he answers in a different way because it brings about the result that we're hoping for. You and I just got to be willing to go along with what God decides and desires, and he will help. But he doesn't always do it our way. Because, again, he knows the best way to give the best help. And the longer you're saved, you kind of learn that a little bit along the way. We have the one true God that's worth more than all the gold in Fort Knox, all the diamonds in, in South Africa, all the oil in Saudi Arabia. He is a great God that we have, that, that is our own and that he desires to be our possession. Well, thirdly and finally, we see the divine promises. In the last portion of this verse in Isaiah 41, we see three distinct promises in relation to the first two points we've looked at. <laughs> Number one, it says, I will strengthen thee, I will strengthen thee. As a Christian, we have access to divine grace. Grace is imparted strength from God that will strengthen our inner heart and enable us to move forward in the right direction. In fact, you're close there. Look at Isaiah 40, the end of the chapter, verses 29 through 31. It says, He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young man shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew or, or revive their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. In other words, God will revive the strength within to keep going <laughs> and to keep doing right, even through the difficult times of life. There is a strengthening aspect that comes from the divine grace that, that, that will be, God will impart upon a person who seeks his help. He says, I will strengthen thee. And you've got to wait for that strength to come. Wait upon the Lord, and he shall renew your strength. Renew it. Restrengthen you. Number two, it says, I will help thee. Very plain in line with our, ta our, our thought today. God knows how helpless we are. You ever felt helpless? <laughs> Sometimes you just feel absolutely helpless. And God knows that we're helpless without him. Our existence itself... He made it in such a way that we are dependent upon him. Colossians 1, verses 16 through 17, For by him, Christ, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Verse 17, And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Right? We are, God made it so that we were dependent upon him. And that help we need has to come from him at times, especially. Now again, that help may not come in the way we think, but it will come in such a way to produce what's best and will produce the best fruit in our lives. And we need to see that from God's perspective. Number three, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Throughout life, we will slip and fail and sometimes when we slip and fail, we, we refuse to get up or we think it's over, it's done. You know, there's no hope for me anymore. I mean, the rest of my existence is just going to be a waste. No, God didn't design failure to be the end. Usually failure tends to be a bright new beginning if it's handled correctly. Why? Because God is there to help and pick you and I back up when we have slipped and fallen in the mud. I like Psalm 37, 23, and 24. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. 
And maybe today you failed in life. Maybe there was a time period in which you weren't very faithful to the Lord. Or maybe right now you're not very faithful to the Lord, but you're like, you know what? God's been speaking to my heart, and I know I've got to get back and being faithful like I'm supposed to be. I, I need to get back faithfully in God's house when I'm supposed to be here. I need to get back faithfully walking with God. I need to get back uh, tithing and giving my offering. I need to get back. I need to get faithful in being a witness. I need to be faithful as a husband or faithful as a wife or I need to get things right with my mom and dad. Whatever it is that you need to do, God will help you and uphold you and pick you back up and get you going in the right direction again. Because who here hasn't failed? We've all failed. But God wants to pick us back up and get us moving in the right direction again. And sometimes our failures end up being the greatest beginnings. Because we learn a lot in failure. We learn what not to do. And we realize that God is always right. Maybe today you failed. But God is telling us in Proverbs 24, 16, For a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again. But the wicked shall fall into mischief. A just man, a saved man, a woman as it were, will fall multiple times, but can rise back up again, and God can go on and use them. Today, do you need some help? Do you need some help? Well, there's a helper up in heaven that wants to step down and give you the assistance that you need and that I need so that we can get the victories we need to win for his glory and honor. And I hope today that if you have any doubt about that, at least a little bit of it was dispelled. And maybe today you've never been saved and you don't know for sure that heaven's your home and you've got some fear about that. You know, God can alleviate that today if you'll come to him in salvation. And in just a moment, you'll have that opportunity. Let's go ahead and, and then stand to our feet. We'll have our time of invitation. Just a, a few moments as the pianist comes and plays on the piano here. We just ask for the sake of people's privacy that heads be bowed and eyes be closed. As people have an opportunity here to spend time with God, you can come down here to the altar and pray if you'd like. You can stay there at your chair. But if that is your need today to talk to God, maybe you need to bring something before the throne of God and ask for his help. You need some help today. Maybe you're struggling with something personally in your life. Uh, maybe there's a, there, there's a burden or maybe there's a, just something that just gnaws at you and you need a little help. You can bring that to God today and he'll help you. He'll give you some instruction, give you some guidance, give you some grace. Inter, interact into your circumstances. Again, now, I can't promise you it's going to be the way you and I think, but it will be what's best according to his plan. You know, maybe today you've never been saved, and that is a concern of your heart. And that is reasonable. I remember when it was a concern of my heart years ago. And I began seeking God, and I didn't know where to look, but I just kind of started seeking after Him. And God brought somebody across my path that began to tell me about how I can know for sure that when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. And over the course of time, as I responded to that light God gave me, God gave me more light and gave me more understanding. And eventually, I came to that understanding of my need, and I turned to Christ and was saved the Bible way. And maybe today that's your need. You know, with every head bowed and every eye closed, there's somebody down here front that would be glad to take you aside and, and answer those spiritual questions and show you how to be saved the Bible way. Our, our desire is not to arm twist people. We want to just give you the Bible. And that the decision is yours, though. This is between you and God. You and God have to make that choice. But God wants to help you with eternity. Because eternity is a long time. We're dead a lot longer than we're alive. And to be wrong about this is costly. If you've never been saved today, I encourage you to really think about that. you need help today though if you are a born again Christian God is willing to answer your call several times in the scriptures we see people that needed God's help and he intervened and he did something I encourage you if you need God's help to just keep praying until you get some sort of answer from God it might take a couple days, might take a few weeks, I don't know, depending on your circumstance. It might be immediate, depending on that too. But I encourage you today, get the help that you need from God. 
You don't have to go about this life on your own. He is there for you. He loves you. If you're one of His, you and I have got a great promise. Father in heaven, today we thank you for your word that we were able to open. And Lord, thank you for folks being here today. And I do pray that you'd bless our time in thy word and that you would have met needs here appropriately from thy word. Father, we thank you for just being willing to be our helper. And Lord, help us to remember that and to find the grace and help in time of need that we at those moments. Father, thank you for this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for being here. You can look this way quick. Um, just a few quick announcements. Again, we do have a, a new sign-up sheet for the GAP Standards 24-hour prayer chain. If you can take a GAP or two or as many as you're able to, and uh, we'll start that this Tuesday. And uh, thank you for being involved in that. And then I uh, just want to continue to encourage you with the Summer Bible Reading Challenge, where our goal is to read through the New Testament in 90 days. And uh, we do, we'll have another drawing like we did in June sometime this month. I won't tell you when, just got to keep you on your toes. But the whole idea is we'll let you know what you need to be read up to. And if you got a little behind, hey, just keep pushing forward. I was, I was talking to somebody here, and they got a little bit behind. And they said, you get through the Gospels, the, the epistles will go faster. You can make up some ground there, a worst-case scenario. But I encourage you, by uh, the 90 days ends Labor Day weekend. So I encourage you to, to uh, take us up on that and be part of that challenge. And we'll have another, offer, or another drawing here for those who have been faithful in uh, your reading and uh, have another gift card to give out sometime here uh, this month. Also, after the service, of course, to stay, stick around and, and have some food with us. We've got burgers, we've got hot dogs, and we've got a slew of other food. So if you don't like that, you, I'm sure you'll find something. But uh, we need all the help we can get to, uh, to be able to eat up everything we've, we're brought here. And then, of course, tonight at 6.30, I'll be continuing our series, Back to Basics, and we'll be talking about the promises of God's Word. We've had a focus on God's Word here recently in the evening, and I think it'll be a help to you. We, our lives hinge on our ability to take God at His promises, and uh, the, the Bible is filled with them. So we'll really look at that tonight, and I think you'll get some help for your heart if you're able to be here. Well, Trent, why don't you come, and uh, if you could pray for the food, and then uh, if we can get some folks to help us with the tables, break down the chairs, just get everything set up, and then uh, once we're ready, we'll, uh, we'll call things to order and, and uh, get serving food. So, thank you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for the message that you laid on the pastor's heart. And Lord, I pray.